they will um, try to maintain strong labor markets while bringing inflation down. But um, it will require skill and also good luck. It's been very interesting since COVID to see the uh, positive high correlation between the NASDAQ 100 and crypto. This follows mostly uh, the lockdowns in China. Obviously, this will have an impact on oil demand. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Francine Lacroix. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, standing in for Francine Lacqua. Here's what's coming up on today's program. Staying the course, the ECB is set to maintain its stimulus withdrawal, prioritizing the inflation fight over the economic risks from the war in Ukraine. President Biden sends $800 million of new weapons to Ukraine. The EU warns member states that Putin's rubles for gas demand would violate sanctions. Plus, Russia turmoil hits J.P. Morgan. The bank's results are marred by a $500 million loss tied to the war. Goldman City and Morgan Stanley all do next to report. Well, it's your Thursday edition of Surveillance. Let's get your check on markets. And it's this easing in the bond sell-off that's allowing equities to outperform your two-year yield, lower by three basis points this morning, lower by 20 basis points over the past week. That's going to be the biggest buying of bonds since March of 2020. Of course, we know what happened then. It was the COVID era that fueled that. So what do you have in terms of equities? You have European stocks up just one-tenth of a percent. U.S. equities were up more than 1% during the cash market trading. So not as strong of a gains. We're up just, just 0 0.0. 0.01% on your equity futures benchmark. Of course, it is a day of heavy, heavy options. Expiry $2 trillion set to expire. So expect a lot of volatility in this market as a lot of those trades are closed out, rolled over, or new ones are put on. Finally, NYMEX crude down more than 1%. City saying that they see Brent at $73 a barrel by year end because of the slowdown in demand. So mixed picture in Europe. We see mostly gains here for tens of 1% for the CAC. DAX is up three tenths of one percent because of those oil losses because the energy complex isn't doing as well. UK uh, stocks FTSE 100 down two tenths of one percent. Of course all of this there is some element of traders sitting waiting on their hands for the ECB. So let's get into it. The European Central Bank debates its latest monetary policy decision in Frankfurt today. The war in Ukraine weighing on growth prospects and runaway inflation giving the ECB a pressing case for further steps towards policy normalization, norm, normalization. For more, we go to our reporter in Frankfurt, Maria Tadeo. So, Maria, it's another meeting that's clouded by the war in Ukraine. Of course, all of the ramifications that brings for the European economy. What can we expect today? Yeah, normalization, Dan, is always a tricky word, but it's also a, a tricky uh, debate today for the European Central Bank and the Governing Council, because as you say, a lot of the outlook here, especially in the medium term, is very clouded over the situation in Ukraine. There's questions here that, frankly, the Central Bank does not have an answer to. When are we going to see an end to this war? What is the full impact of sanctions? We really don't know because we haven't seen the end of it. And then, of course, Annie, you have the biggest wild card here is, do we get an energy embargo? And if we get an energy embargo, at that point, your inflation expectations, your inflation projections, will they go off the charts? This is also happening at a time in which the macro picture is very complicated, too. We have seen repeatedly growth projections have been cut, revised down, and the inflation pressures continue. Yesterday, we had the Spanish numbers that came out, double-digit inflation now in the country. And that's just one example. So there's a lot to debate here today at the European Central Bank. We're not expecting a monetary policy decision. But again, the question is, does Christine Lagarde keep some ambiguity around this given the uh, cloudy impact of this uh, war or actually will she confirm this hawkish tilt at the governing council by perhaps hinting there is now a date for the end of QE that has huge implications for the first uh, rate hike which by the way the market is already pricing in for September and then again I expect a question and this could get very interesting about if we do get this exit strategy now being firmed up does the central bank have a plan B potentially for some of the volatility we could see in the markets and particularly in spreads? 
Maria, thank you very much. That's our reporter, Maria Tadeo in Frankfurt, gearing up for the ECB decision. And here in the studio, we're joined now by Morgan Del Don, head of investment strategy for Europe at Global X ETFs. Morgan, thanks so much for joining us. So I was just looking at some of the pricing around today's meeting. Euro volatility, for example, in high demand. So it does seem there's some element of traders who are perhaps bracing for a surprise from the ECB. Are you bracing for a surprise? Well, Danny, that could be some surprise. Uh, first of all, I do expect the ECB to acknowledge the um, slowdown, like in the macro backdrop, mm. but also the sentiment from business and consumer sentiment uh, that has been like lowered in the past months. So all of these um, call for a more gradual approach to normalization. And uh, I think markets is expecting the ECB uh, to give hints on when the uh, actually the uh, quantitative easing will end because mm. that will give a better sense on when they will start to increase interest rates. So if it's early Q3 around June, uh, that would probably be September. But if they indicate that they will push back to the end of Q3 uh, and more August, then September could be uh, at stake for uh, another pushback. Mm. Um, but overall, I think what's important to see is the market is expecting 70 basis right. points increase uh, in the key rates for the ECB by the year end. And I do and you think, think that's too much, right? I do think yeah. that is a, it's a bit aggressive considering that they will only start at best from September. Well, it is interesting because there does seem to be this disconnect between what markets and many economists think. You have markets, for example, certainly September is in play, but a lot of economists think it's December perhaps when the ECB starts to act. What do you make of this disconnect, of this perhaps too hawkishness, too much hawkishness coming from the market? Well, the market is uh, is waiting for the central banks to fight inflation. The problem is that in Europe, it's a very different situation from the U.S. In Europe, it's mostly uh, a supply-led inflation over uh, which the ECB has almost no control over. Um, so it makes it a very tricky situation because it's a very it's an arbitrage between growth and inflation and therefore the market is, is expecting inflation to slow down but the ECB tools is quite limited. Right and, and it's certainly just a, a very tight line that the ECB has to walk. Morgan you're going to stick around with us. That's Morgan Del Don, head of investment strategy for Europe at Global X ETF. So want to bring us some breaking lines as well on VW delivering their prelim first quarter adjusted operating profit coming in at about eight and a half billion euros. Um, again, this is we're looking at uh, shares right now. They were up about one percent for VW. They initially plunged on that headline, but they're back up higher. So pushing higher. It seems like the market is liking this headline again. Eight and a half billion euros. They are saying that the uh, effects uh, of the further course of the Ukraine war still cannot be predicted with sufficient certainty. We've certainly uh, seen a lot of companies attempting to predict that, but VW is saying that there are still risks for further developments that will have a negative impact on their business activity, and that also might include bottlenecks in the supply chain. Well, let's get to your other top stories this morning with the Bloomberg First Word News. Here's Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Good morning, Danny, and thank you. The U.S. is sending Ukraine $800 million worth of new military firepower, including helicopters, heavy artillery systems, and armored personnel carriers. The move signals a more intense military commitment after earlier shipments of mostly defensive weapons. Now, New York City law enforcement officials have made an arrest in connection with Tuesday shooting at a Brooklyn, Brooklyn subway station that injured more than two dozen people. A 21-year-old man who was working in security at a Manhattan shop says he helped with the apprehension of the suspect. I seen you walk on the sidewalk. I was watching the camera from the screen. And I thought, oh my God, this is the guy. He killed the seven people. We need to catch him. The UK is set to announce a partnership with Rwanda as part of an effort to curb illegal immigration across the English Channel. It's reported the government plans to send migrants to the East African country for processing. The issue of people crossing the Channel has vexed the British government for years, with tens of thousands of people using the route each year to enter the UK. Global News, 24 hours a day, on air and on Bloomberg Quick Take, powered by more than 2,700 journalists and analysts in more than one. 120 countries. I'm Leanne Gerens. This is Bloomberg. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Well, coming up, we're going to have more analysis ahead of the ECB's policy decision later today. 
Christian Lagarde and colleagues signal liftoff to come. Stay with Bloomberg TV. This is Bloomberg. to maintain strong labor markets while bringing inflation down. But, and it has been done in the past, it's not an impossible combination, but um, it will require skill and also good luck. And um, I know that that's what they will try to accomplish. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen there talking about inflation. And let's talk more about inflation here. We're joined now by Bloomberg's market editor Christine Aquino and Morgane Del Don from Global X ETFs is still with us. Um, Morgan, I, I feel like we've had some bets put on recently that perhaps inflation has peaked in the U.S., or at least there's this narrative building around it. But I look at Bloomberg's scoop today on Amazon increasing their seller prices by 5 percent to cope with rising fuel prices. To me, at least, that, that doesn't feel like we've hit a peak in inflation. Well, Danny, I think what we're seeing is a peak of base effect uh, from the pandemic. But actually, in the U.S. in particular, you have inflation pressure coming from the supply side and the demand side because of the tightness of the job market. So um, it will be very interesting to closely follow earnings and the guidance from companies to kind of go gauge how much inflation we can expect in the, in, in the medium term. Mm. But certainly this increase in commodity prices will have lagging effect on inflation and inflation is very hard to reverse. Yeah, Christine, jump in here. Well, I find it really hard to believe that inflation is speaking narrative. Yeah. And I think what really kicked it off was that slight miss to the U.S. core CPI on Wednesday. But one number really does not make a trend and really does not reverse the strong momentum that we've seen in inflation over the past year. And so I think what we're seeing here also as far as the bond market reaction goes is it's kind of a combination of there's been a lot of momentum in the move higher in bond yields and move higher in rate hike expectations. And, you know, it's probably a good excuse to take some money off the table, especially as we're heading into a long weekend. Yeah, heading into a long weekend. Don't want to hold that risk. Morgan, I, th I thought you made a really interesting point about earnings because I do feel like that margin pressure is starting to show up. At first, it was the story of, OK, corporates, they can pass along prices. They have pricing power. But I look at Bed Bath & Beyond yesterday, for example, who said that they see consumer demand slow. Are you seeing signs that that story has started to run out or is that just kind of a one-off example? Well, I think that for this year, at least, um, even if the Fed is increasing interest rates, it will just normalize them to a neutral stance. So we're not in this restrictive territory where you have a danger for uh, capital uh, for, for these companies, especially the gross companies. And it's quite interesting to see gross, U.S. gross stocks continue to rise, even if we have expectations of higher interest rates. This is because, first of all, the, the, the interest rates are only rising from a very low base mm. and until they reach 2.5 percent which is kind of the neutral uh, interest rates um, that won't have a significant impact on margins I, I believe and cap capital uh, raising as well. Well Christine to, to, to Morgan's point I mean I, I kind of don't see how the value trade can really be successful if banks aren't playing along if we get more of JP Morgan type earnings where there's concerns about recession there's the impact of Russia deal flow isn't there it, it sets us up for not the best earnings season to put it mildly for banks. Absolutely, Danny. And I think that really will be the focus primarily um, for the bank earning season is how much of a hit are they going to be taking from the Russia aspect of it? We saw JP Morgan taking that 500 plus million loss over that pullout from Russia. I think Citibank in particular would be mm. interesting because they are among the most exposed of the banks that are reporting today to Russia. I think they have nearly $10 billion worth of exposure to that country. And so it's going to be interesting interesting to see how much of an impact that has and it could probably overwhelm any other sort of good news that we could see um, and set the tone for the rest of the earnings season. Morgan, are you looking at banks as a sort of that bellwether at all for the American economy, for the American consumer or sort of the general business atmosphere right now? Well, banks are certainly important, but I don't think they are as much important for the U.S. economy mm. as the banks are for the, the Eurozone economy. So um, because the U.S. is more capital-based market, uh, not a 
bank system economy, um, I do feel that um, there will be less of an impact compared to what could happen for uh, the Eurozone if they were in this situation. I mean, what do you make of European banks right now? Are, are, do they look good or is that Russia exposure just, just a reason to kind of back off? And of course, the secondary effects of the impact to the economy. Well, actually, the, the Russian conflict uh, with, with Ukraine is highly predictable and it will have impacts not only on banks but on across all sectors in, in Europe because we are at the epicenter of, of the war. Um, so in that context, I'm just looking at how we can hedge against this volatility. Having more a defensive strategy stance is, is better, but also looking at volatility hedges with like diversification benefits. Mm -hmm. So um, I would probably look for diversifiers outside banks and traditional sectors, but more around uh, themes like clean technologies, which are not only very low correlated to, to broader European equities, but also have these uh, structural tailwinds as we, mm -hmm. as we transition to a more energy independence in Europe. Well, speaking of which, the energy story, I, it's just been dominating everything. And, and Christine, I know during the commercial break, we were talking about this Ed Morris note over at City saying that oil is likely to decline $73 a barrel by fourth quarter. The demand picture he really highlighted. What do you make of that? It certainly is a contrarian bet at the moment. Absolutely, Danny, but I would tend to agree. I think we've mm. seen quite a big run up in oil, but a lot of that had to do with the geopolitical risks related to Russia. And it seems like the path now, it, it, it's overdone in terms of the upside. And you're absolutely right to bring in the discussion over demand destruction at this point. I know Morgan is looking at China as well and the situation there. It's really not looking great in terms of commodities demand. And so now that we're kind of in the situation where um, potentially the geopolitical risk could um, uh, ease a little bit from here and bring oil down, plus that demand picture that's really deteriorating. I, I, I tend to agree. Hmm. Things are not looking good for oil right now. Okay, we're going to have to leave it there. Morgane, Christine, thanks so much for joining. That was Bloomberg's market editor, Christine Aquino, and Morgane Deldon, head of investment strategy for Europe at Global X ETFs. Coming up on the program, President Xi Jinping says China will stick to its zero-tolerance approach to covid even as public anger simmers in Shanghai and the economic costs mount. We'll have that story for you next. This is Bloomberg. attitude towards China and its willingness to embrace further economic integration may well be affected by China's reaction to our call for resolute action on Russia. U.S. Treasury Secretary Janet Yellen there. And let's stay on the China narrative. President Xi Jinping says his government will stick to its zero-tolerance approach to COVID. That's even as public anger simmers in Shanghai and the economic costs mount. Joining us for more on this is Bloomberg's chief Asia economics correspondent, Enda Curran. Enda, are we seeing any signs of improvement just when it comes to containing these outbreaks across China? There's some modest easing of the lockdowns that are going on in places like Shanghai, Danny, and some hints that perhaps cases are plateauing, but nonetheless, cases do remain uh, very high by Chinese standards, given they're pursuing this very aggressive approach of controlling the virus. And of course, most importantly, even as people complain about the conditions they're going through in terms of food shortages and everything else, uh, President Xi Jinping came out with those comments in Hainan, making it clear that there will be no diversion from this uh, dynamic zero approach to aggressively controlling the virus. He said persistence will be victory. And of course, that underscores that China is going to stick doggedly with this path, even though it's hurting the economy. We'll get data on Monday that's probably expected to show at least some of the pain starting to flow through and the ongoing reports of a continued disruption to some manufacturing from this as well. And we came back from the commercial there just playing some sound of yelling. She was talking about China being a moment for choosing on world order. What was the main takeaway from her speech and ultimately what does it mean for relations between the U.S. and China? Very blunt remarks, Dan, you'd have to say, by any standard, especially coming from an economic official. As you mentioned there, her core point was, look, this is a time for choosing. She, she said it's not a time to be assisting Russia economically after its invasion 
of Ukraine. She called out China for unfair practices. She spoke of the need for, at the very least, a rejigging or a remolding of the international order that governs the world economy. Now, at the same time, she did pull back. For, uh, she said she doesn't want a bipolar uh, uh, polarization of the global economy and she didn't spell out any specific or concrete alternatives or initiatives or examples as to what the US intends to pursue. But nonetheless, though, in terms of tone and language, very striking, very direct stuff from the US Treasury Secretary. Mm. And it does underscore the tensions, tensions that are existing now between the US and China. And they're just 30 seconds here, but elsewhere in China, triple R cut, is that in the cards? Uh, lots of economists expect the central bank to take some kind of move, Danny, and there's a lot of expectation that a triple R cut could be among them. And uh, brief to the point, fantastic as always, that's Bloomberg's and uh, current. And we did see uh, Asia markets today. They did rally MSCI Asia Pacific index up six tenths of a percent. CSI 300 closed up one and a quarter percent. That is a market bracing for easing to come. Of course, a very different narrative that we've heard from the BOC yesterday. We are uh, expecting to hear from the Fed. But of course, we're not expecting exactly to hear that hawkish language from the ECB. Coming up, we will discuss the ECB. How are they going to navigate soaring inflation and a war in Europe? That next, this is Bloomberg. Staying the course, the ECB is set to maintain its stimulus withdrawal, prioritizing the inflation fight over the economic risks from the war in Ukraine. President Biden says sends $800 million of new weapons to Ukraine. The EU warns member states that Putin's rubles for gas demand would violate sanctions. Plus, Russia turmoil hits J.P. Morgan. The bank's results are marred by a $500 million loss tied to the war. Goldman City and Morgan Stanley all due to report today. Good morning and welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance. This is the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London, standing in for Francine Lacroix. Let's get your check on markets, which continue to be dominated by this pullback on bets around uh, the, the Fed, the central banks, really, of course, we have the ECB today as well. But you're looking at a two-year yield that's down two basis points just under, of course, as soon as I say two basis points, it goes to 1.8. But nonetheless, it has been a drop of just about 20 basis points so far this week in the front end of the curve, a 25 basis point hike being priced out of the Fed. So what does that mean? It means that equities yesterday were able to rally. But just in the last 30 minutes, we're looking at S&P 500 futures that have dipped into the red, of course, not Dramatically, they are little changed. Same goes for Europe stocks uh, 600, about to enter a long weekend and an ECB decision, as I was saying. So, it might be some hesitancy to really hold on to risk over the long weekend. So, the ECB debating its latest monetary policy decision in Frankfurt today. The war in Ukraine and its effects on growth, plus runaway inflation, will likely be top of the agenda. For more, we go to our reporter in Frankfurt, Maria Tadeo. Maria, it's yet another meeting that's been clouded, not just by the war in Ukraine, but of course, the second order impact that will have on the European economy. How is the ECB going to balance that with the rising inflation picture? Yes, Danny, and you have to deal with the impact of a war and then, of course, price pressures that are going through the roof across the euro area. And this is a very complicated scenario for the central bank uh, to navigate. It's very difficult to now monitor the risks but also be able to model them because in many ways, Danny, and we have to be honest, the ECB does not have the answers, but also they can't control it. We don't know when the war in Ukraine is going to end. We don't know the full impact of sanctions. And by the way, we're not done yet on that front. And then, of course, you have the biggest wild card here, which is do we get an energy Embargo. And if that happens, then I guess at that point, it's very safe to say your inflation expectations, your inflation projections, well, they're off the chart. So all of this is a complicated picture that the central bank has to navigate today. We're not expecting a policy decision to be made, but we are expecting a big debate in the governing council. Now, when it comes to the press conference, where well, there's three things that we're watching out for. One is, is Christine Lagarde going to really confirm this hawkish tilt from the governing council? Is she going to confirm that the hawks are in command? 
by potentially hinting now with a clear date the end of QE. Remember, the market right now is guided for Q3, but maybe June has been floated as a dead end for that. Then, of course, that huge implications for the rate hike. But by the way, the market is already pricing in for September, so there's no point pushing back against that. And then the other thing that I would watch out for, which I think, of course, is very interesting here is, will she hint perhaps that the bank also has a plan B in case we get market volatility and that reflects in spread? So I'm sure Fred is going to uh, talk about this uh, in detail <laughs> next. But, you know, there's a big question here in terms of does she confirm the hawkish tilt or actually do we get some strategic ambiguity, especially in the context of the war in Ukraine? Maria, thank you very much. That's Maria Tadeo in Frankfurt, who will be all on top of the ECB decision today. And as Maria was saying, we are joined now by Frederic Ducroze, global strategist at Pictate Wealth Management. Frederic, thanks so much for joining. Um, you know, I, I am struck by your notes because I love, I love a little bit of a mea culpa. You were saying that you thought in the last meeting the ECB would be more cautious or that they would be more cautious in the last couple of months, and you were wrong on that. But this time... You do think some caution is warranted. Walk me through your thinking for today's meeting. Yes, that's true. At the very least, I would say there's no point, as Maria just said, uh, to make a hard decision today. The ECB just made mm. the pace of QE purchases in the, third, in the third quarter depending on the data. They will remain data dependent, that's, that's for sure. What's the point in, in making a hard decision and, and giving a hard date, uh, end date to the APP in July, for instance, as Maria said as well? The market is anyway already pricing in a, a first rate hike in September. But uh, as uh, I said, I think the ECB and President Lagarde will not push against market pricing. There is a strong, very strong pressure, political pressure actually on the ECB to sound hawkish, to sound uh, very aggressive uh, in terms of policy normalization that will remain uh, the plan with flexibility, with two-way uh, optionality, with gradualism, but uh, the path to higher rates will remain the baseline scenario, I think. We're also just talking during the commercial break, Frederic, about the idea that it's a longer gap than usual between their meetings. What does that mean for any sort of concrete action or at least laying out the path that the ECB is able to do today? Well, you're right. We got it wrong in the last couple of meetings, uh, um, perhaps underappreciating the pressure that was on the governing council with uh, inflation running at higher than 7% in the euro area. There's no way that the ECB keeps on buying bonds uh, and, and uh, with negative rates. So the pressure is uh, really on. Uh, that means that what could happen is that uh, you might not be willing to wait for eight weeks, which is indeed an unusually long delay between the next meeting uh, on the 9th of uh, June. Uh, before hinting at uh, a liftoff. And again, there is no way, uh, I mean, and no need for the ECB to be more explicit, but uh, you could make uh, a conditional assessment of the end of the APP in July if everything goes according to the plan. The problem for the ECB is that in June, they will also have the updated staff projections, and everywhere you look at the moment, there are downside risks to activity. If we get indeed uh, an energy embargo uh, from uh, Russia, then uh, the downside risk to activity, to GDP growth in June will be even more acute. And then it's difficult for the ECB to say, look, we were data dependent, we're downgrading our GDP forecast, but we're still going for an even faster normalization. Mm. That's where the uh, trade-off is a bit uh, uh, tricky to navigate indeed. All those risks also suggest that inflation has yet to peak in Europe. We continue to see higher readings come in. And I know the debate in the U.S., Frederic, is really has inflation peaked. But one of the dynamics in Europe that I find fascinating, and the ECB mentioned this in their last meeting uh, accounts as well, the idea that there are stronger unions, there's longer wage agreements in the euro area. What does that mean for the ECB in terms of how far, how long they're able to keep uh, policy tight if we do see kind of that lagging effect of wage inflation? That's a very good point indeed. I think there are many differences with the U.S. Obviously, core inflation is above 6% in the U.S., only 3% in the euro area. But you're right. The uh, sequencing and the short-term outlook is very different. We get probably to 3.5% at some point uh, in the next few months. So we are not yet at the peak in terms of core inflation in the euro area. And that's with uh, uh, wage growth running at 2%-ish uh, 
uh, uh, in the wage inflation in, uh, in Germany is yet to accelerate. Indeed, we're looking at uh, every round of wage negotiation. We get IG Metal in the industrial sector in September. But so far, we have mixed signals. So perhaps it's a 2023 story. And that's another reason for the ECB to prepare for normalization, perhaps even to talk about a higher uh, terminal rate uh, that uh, is currency, currently planned uh, in, in the governing council. Because if we get next year perhaps some easing on the energy front, but at the same time some acceleration on core inflation and wage growth, that would be an environment, uh, assuming everything else stabilizes, where the ECB might be willing to actually go faster. Frederick, I can't let you go without asking about the peripheral debt in Europe. There has been some outperformance after a Bloomberg scoop last weekend, basically saying that the ECB was preparing this crisis tool should bond yields blow out. Can that outperformance uh, versus the core, that tightening, do you expect that to last through today's meeting? My concern is that there's a lot of complacency in the, in the bond market right now, perhaps even vis-à-vis uh, -vis the French election, by the way, in the short term. But beyond that, the fact that the ECB would implicitly step in if we had a, a wider, uh, I mean, a widening, a sharper widening in peripheral spreads. Uh, yes, ultimately, that's likely to be the case. But for now, I think there is a strong disagreement uh, within the governing council in terms of what kind of uh, spread levels might be uh, tolerated and if and when the ECB might uh, be willing to step in, how. You know, when you be watching the ECB for long enough, you know that what's usually working is constructive ambiguity. I think the less Christine Lagarde says about a contingency QE program, the better, because otherwise the market would likely test them and test their credibility and commitment. Frederic, great to have you on today. Hope you've had your coffee. You're prepared for today's meeting. Frederic D. Cruze, global strategist at Pictate Wealth Management. Thanks for joining and enjoy your long weekend as well. Coming up, investors will be watching later to see if Goldman City, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo can live up to expectations. That's after JP Morgan fell short. We're going to discuss U.S. bank earnings next. This is Bloomberg. Unpredictable. Wars have unpredictable outcomes. You've already seen in oil markets, the oil markets are, are, are precarious. Okay, so I pointed that out over and over that if you know people don't understand that those things can change dramatically. JP Morgan CEO Jamie Dimon there speaking about the challenges ahead for the bank. That came as JP Morgan's first quarter results yesterday showed a marring from the fallout of Russia's invasion of Ukraine. Now, today is also going to be busy for U.S. bank earnings. We have Citi, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo all reporting today. So, to help us work through them all, Bloomberg's finance reporter Charlie Wells is here with us. Um, so, JP Morgan reports yesterday clearly a disappointment in terms of share price reaction. What does that foreshadow to what we're expecting today? I would say cloudy with an attempt at optimism. Mm. So there are a lot of challenges that we've seen banks have to deal with this quarter. We knew that there were going to be challenges in predicting or at least trying to estimate what the Fed would do. No one was expecting Russia to invade Ukraine and that threw, of course, sanctions, that threw more volatility, that threw a lot of price changes that you know, no one was necessarily ready for. And there's a theme that I think we really want to pay attention for the, uh, in, today in particular is that pipeline of deals that we were talking about mm. so much in early 2022 that has slowed down. So beyond deals, beyond Russia, what else are we really looking for in terms of the numbers when we get them today? Yeah, so, you know, if we want to think about some of these specific banks, I think there's going to be a lot of different stories from a lot of different banks. So Citigroup in particular has quite a global exposure, and that's different from a lot of these large banks. About 50% of its revenue comes from around the world. Now, you contrast that with, say, Wells Fargo, which is much more domestically focused. I think we're probably going to hear a lot more about, say, its hefty mortgage portfolio, mm -hmm. residential mortgages. Um, um, but let's say we hear Wells talk about some of these geo geopolitical ramifications. That could be a sign that some of these secondary impacts from Russia's invasion could be creeping into some of these mm. more domestic banks. So you make the point about uh, mortgages being impactful. What sort of reading are we likely to get on the health of the American consumer from the more domestically oriented banks? Yes, yeah, so we've been getting some kind of conflicting signals just in other data points, right? We're seeing inflation peak or, or you know, reach record levels. We're seeing, um, we're seeing consumer behavior, you know, 
know, continue. We're seeing spending continue. And we saw a little bit of a mix of this in J.P. Morgan's report yesterday, right? So we saw J.P. Morgan for accounting reasons uh, setting aside $900 million in case of loan losses mm -hmm. in the future, which is not a great sign. But then, of course, we saw, you know, total loans increase 6%. Um, and we saw card behavior. We saw credit card spending. We saw debit card usage up as well. So slightly mixed signals. But I think, you know, Jamie Dimon yesterday said he did have faith, at least in the short term, in the American consumer and the American economy. Yeah, that really shows everyone who's just obsessed with the macro picture that just a steepening yield curve, higher yields, isn't enough to help the banks outperform. Charlie, thanks as always. That's our very own Charlie Wells. Now let's get to the Bloomberg Business Flash. With that is Leanne Garens. Good morning, Leanne. Danny, good morning. Italy's Benetton family and Blackstone have made a 19 billion euro bid to buy out Italian infrastructure group Atlantia. The offer values the target at 65.5 billion euros, including total debt in what could be one of the largest ever infrastructure deals. Now, India's reliance industry is said to be weighing a bid for the international drugstore unit of Walgreens Boots Alliance. Billionaire Mukesh Ambani is in the midst of pivoting his refining focus conglomerate towards businesses that will help him tap India's billion plus consumers. Bloomberg understands Boots could be valued at as much as £7 billion. And London bankers looking to move jobs while they have plenty of options as a shortage of qualified candidates pushes firms to offer hefty pay increases. According to a survey by recruiter Morgan McKinley, there was a 73% increase in jobs available in the first quarter. Now that's compared to the same period last year. People jumping ship clinched an average 22% salary uplift when they did change their employer. And that's your Bloomberg Business Flash. Danny. Leanne, thanks so much. Leanne Garens there. Now, when it comes to valuing disruptive innovation, private markets seem to understand the opportunity better than the stock market. That's according to Kathy Wood, founder and chief executive of ARK Investment Management. Wood appeared in a panel at the Exchange ETF conference in Miami. Here's more of what she had to say. Our conviction in our strategy has increased. The concentration is one reason. But we've had this past year of research, and if anything, our expectations uh, for these companies into which we've concentrated have gone up over, in terms of our return expectations over the next five years as the price has gone down more than 50%. Uh, and against the private market, where valuations are, have tripled in many cases over the past year. So we think the private market has it more correct. We're seeing some down rounds now take place in the private markets, but those are not in the companies that we believe are truly disruptive. I, I would just add, there's, there's a lack of authenticity in some of the criticisms of Kathy, because of course, if the price goes down and Kathy has this strong view of how the future is going to evolve, the return will go up. You see the same sort of lack of uh, authenticity in criticisms of hodlers of Bitcoin. Hodler is just another word for buy and hold. And by the way, they're up 14 million percent in the last 10 years. <laughs> They've been doing okay. Would you rather they were timing the market? No, if you have long-term conviction, you want to be sticking to your guns. You want to be focusing your efforts. Uh, and of course, if the price comes down, that makes you, you know, excited about the future returns. Yeah, there is a, a chart. Brett Winton, our director of research, uh, drew it up. It's on Twitter, and the title is Time, Not Timing. And he drew the returns going back to eight, uh, 1875 uh, to now. If you had held, everything is green. It's the timing, you know, trying to time the moves where you're making big mistakes. Yeah, and I also think, again, when you're hit from the fundamental side, I think a lot of people own, already own those stocks, again, in a cheap beta fund. So they don't, they don't need you to do that. Yeah, I, that's not why they're hiring you. They're the allocator. You're not their allocator. The, where you will see us move into those stocks is w if we move into a bull market yeah. where, where our names go crazy to the upside, we will put in cash-like innovation stocks, Apple, Alphabet, and so forth. But that's because we want to increase the liquidity. L liquidity There's, sleeves. Yeah. Yeah, like uh, high-yield managers do that with HYG. Yeah. Kathy Wood, their founder and chief executive of ARK Investment Management at the Exchange ETF conference in Miami. Of course, Kathy Wood's main fund has dropped some 35% year-to-date compared with a 6.3% drop for the S&P 500. Coming up on the program, Amazon will hit sellers on its platform with a fuel inflation surcharge. We're going to dive into that story next. This is Bloomberg.
Economics, finance, politics. This is Bloomberg Surveillance, the early edition. I'm Danny Berger in London. To Amazon, which will add a 5% fuel and inflation fee to sellers on its platform. That surcharge is expected to kick in April 28th for U.S. merchants. Joining us now to discuss is Quick Takes Alex Webb. Alex, let's start with the basics. Break it down. Why is Amazon doing this and who exactly is going to be paying up? So they're going to be adding this 5% surcharge to the people who basically use the full gamut of Amazon services on the selling side. So there are people who sell products on Amazon. It is warehoused by Amazon, delivered by Amazon. Those costs are going to be increased by 5%, you know, because of inflation, because fuel is getting a lot more expensive. Now, although they might be sh uh, shouldering the initial costs, the expectation is that cost will inevitably get passed on to consumers. A lot of the margins on which these guys operate is qu are quite narrow. So therefore, in order to be able to turn a profit, the cost will have to be passed on. Actually, when I first saw this, my first reaction was one of surprise but when I kind of sit on and think about it the idea that Amazon is having to raise prices here I mean it's not all that shocking considering what they're having to pay up for fuel yeah and you know we forget sometimes that Amazon massive company the e-commerce operations are not terribly profitable mm. Amazon itself operates on very fine margins it makes more than three quarters of its profit from Amazon Web Services, its cloud business. That subsidizes the rest of it. So in order to ensure they're not being pushed into, you know, big loss-making territory, these sort of things maybe aren't necessary. But it does speak to something else, namely Amazon's market power, the mm. fact that they can do this sort of thing. Well, that gets us into the antitrust scrutiny as well. Does this or will this raise more red flags with regulators? It certainly, it certainly is something that I would imagine will be used as a stick to beat Amazon in the years ahead. The fact that they can do this sort of thing. They also raised prices last month as well, as, as our colleague Spencer Soper has reported. The people selling on Amazon do not have much other option. They can't mm. say, you know, shove off, we're not going to pay that, we're going to go to your competitor, because there aren't that many competitors. There's Shopify, it's a little bit different. It doesn't the marketplace, you've still got to build your own website, and then you've got to pay for customer acquisition, all these sort of things, where if you're on Amazon, you know, it's a, it's a turnkey solution which Shopify doesn't have. So. It does speak to Amazon's market power. It may pose further questions. From a consumer standpoint, in terms of what consumers are willing to pay on this platform, should this filter through to them? I mean, already Amazon, it's cheaper than a lot of other options. Do you think there is a willingness to pay up more to get some of the delivery from Amazon? Well, with so many tech companies, what they talk about certainly in their VC pitches earlier on in, the, in their cycle, is being habit-forming. Mm. You know, something like Uber, habit-forming, they say. Others might say, well, it's very easy to switch something else. Amazon potentially is something that's very habit-forming. There are some really interesting stats in, in Spencer's piece where he says that um, back in uh, 2014, the profit margin one company, well, Amazon would have taken a 19% cut from their, uh, mm. you know, uh, sellers. Right, right, right. Now they take a 34% cut. So they've been able to build that up. The fact is Amazon is really cheap in terms of getting stuff to your door incredibly quickly. Is it too cheap? Uh, some, you could say yes, that mm. actually there are people getting squeezed all the way along that chain and not making as much money as they could or should. And Amazon is actually the beneficiary of that because they are building these habits. Right. It, it certainly has been, again, for regulators, really a point of contention in terms of is everyone getting treated fairly along the production line? Alex, thanks so much as always. That is our uh, Alex Webb from Quick Take. Well, Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition continues in the next hour. Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Anna Edwards. Out of London, more market conversations to come. This is Bloomberg. I think especially in the beginning of early season, it's a good time to own volatility. Inflation is primarily a concern for this first quarter earnings reporting season. Corporate America has really strong pricing power. On the Wall Street side, uh, the first quarter is going to be difficult. But Main Street, it's about the consumer. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition with Anna Edwards, Matt Miller and Kaylee Lines. It's 10 a.m. in London, 5 a.m. in New York and 5 p.m. in Hong Kong on Thursday, April 14th. Our top stories today. Four of Wall Street's biggest banks report earnings today. Investors will be waiting to see if results are hurt by market fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Decision day for the European Central Bank is expected to make the fight against inflation the priority over risks to the economy caused by the war. 
And President Biden is sending the heavy weapons to Ukraine. The U.S. is preparing an $800 million military aid package. Meanwhile, Russia warns how it may respond if Sweden and Finland join NATO. Welcome to Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Kriti Gupta in New York. Kayleigh Lyons is off today. And Kriti, we're waiting here in Europe for the ECB rate decision and on both sides of the, of the Atlantic waiting for a long weekend. Yeah, and it has a lot to do with what central banks around the world are really doing. That's really what described Asia sessions. Let's talk about uh, simply some of the assets that we're moving. It's simply a lot of green on the screen when it comes to Asian assets. The Chinese stock market, for example, actually higher. This is on expectations that tomorrow that we are going to see an imminent rate cut from uh, the PBOC, as well as a de decrease in the reserve requirement ratio. So as the rest of the world is perhaps hiking up rates, China actually easing just a little bit. And you can see that sentiment has crossed into the Asia Pacific index broadly. So Asia having a little bit of green on the screen. Let's see if that translates to uh, the American sessions at once stocks open up in just a couple of hours. We should also talk about the currency picture because it's not just China uh, that is front and center there. We should also talk about the Japanese yen, which saw a little bit of strength. We know there's been a lot of weakness when it comes to the Japanese yen, specifically how the BOJ is going to control some of the issues that were domestic. Remember, Japan is also a net importer of oil, so they're also dealing with sky-high inflation. The other one we want to talk about is the Bank of Korea, and you can see a little bit of strength in the Korean won as well. Weakness when it comes to the dollar against those Asian currencies. The Bank of Korea also talking about a rate hike. So really, Matt, the theme of today seems to be central banking around the world. Yeah, absolutely. I'll tell you what, though. Japan does export a lot of car parts. So um, for U.S. Yeah. car makers buying stuff there, the weak yen is um, uh, 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 pretty good news. Take a look at what we got going on here. S&P futures not doing a whole lot of anything, but the 10-year yield is down at six, uh, 2.6768. So yesterday we were looking at 2.76. The volatility in the bond market just continues to surprise. Crude as well. It's coming down a little bit, but from a really high level. TI trading at 103.64 a barrel. We have Brent the global benchmark up over $108 a barrel, and Bitcoin is falling, but just marginally at 41179 In fact, it's higher um, at this point today than it was at this point yesterday. Remember, we measure from uh, midnight, but Bitcoin trades 24-7 all year round, even when it's Good Friday, which, Anna, I believe that's not a national holiday here. I know my wife has to work tomorrow, but those of us uh, who work in the markets <laughs> okay. get off. The markets get yes, in, indeed, and, uh, and uh, a number of different religious groups celebrating with uh, with holidays tomorrow. And we've got a, a mixed picture really for European equity markets. And the last trading day of the week here in Europe, we see many of these markets moving higher. We, Matt was mentioning those lower Treasury yields. That's part of the driving force here. We're waiting for the ECB, of course, and so there could be volatility around that. But we've also had the earnings story in the mix as well. Let me show you the travel and leisure stock because that is. Uh, flying, excuse the pun, up by 1.6% this morning. Wizz Air, Eastern European focused business, but even they are positive about the summer season and what that could bring. And so that's uh, certainly a driver for better sentiment in that sector. Atlantia is a highways operator over in Italy. They've received a bid from Blackstone and the Benetton family. If this goes through at around $20 billion, this would be the biggest takeover of the year so far, year to date. So that's stock up by nearly 5%. Ericsson in telecom equipment down by 5.3%. They've said that they are likely to face a fine from the DOJ. This is to do with their uh, activities over in Iraq. They also missed estimates, and that's to do with their operations in Russia. All of that added up to negativity. I mentioned the, the uh, ECB. We're waiting, uh, as we know, for the interest rate decision and all the associated hawkishness perhaps coming through there. 109.04 is where we trade. Of course, there's dollar weakness in here as well to do with treasuries, but there is a slightly stronger euro, even if the cost of hedging the euro uh, seems to suggest that market participants are thinking this could be a volatile day in euro dollar trade. So we'll watch that. Stocks in Russia down 1.7%. And in fact, the month of April has been quite negative for Russian stocks. Unchanged on the ruble, uh, we understand that, I mean, this is a currency market that is completely broken in the view of Timothy Ash, who we spoke to yesterday. Uh, we understand that the capital controls that Russia has in place here could be tweaked a little bit, could be pulled back a little bit, certainly in relation to some of the large corporates in Russia and how much they need to transfer their foreign FX into rubles. We'll watch that development. Chrissy.
Yeah, a lot going on the FX market. It's not just about central banks. It's about really where the flows are going on around the world. A lot of that, once again, coming down to what the haven bid is and what is dealing uh, with inflation the best. Let's take a look at what's coming up ahead today. Anna, as you mentioned, we'll get that ECB rate decision at 7.45 a.m. New York time. Fed speak also continues with Loretta Mester and Patrick Harker. Bloomberg's Michael McKee also has an exclusive interview with New York Fed President John Williams. That's coming up at 8.45 a.m. New York time. And U.S. bank earnings continue with Goldman Sachs, Citi, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo all reporting. Matt, there's a lot on the docket today. A lot on the docket with banks. I should point out uh, Volkswagen also at $8.5 billion in operating earnings. Big, big hedging boost. I think almost $4 billion in a boost um, from hedging. Let's get back to the banks, though. That's our focus today. J.P. Morgan's results were marred by the market fallout from Russia's invasion of Ukraine. We learned that yesterday. Exposure to Russia will be the fo in focus today as well as more U U.S. banks report. Certainly Citi. We're going to be watching very closely for that. Let's get over um, for more to Bloomberg's Shanali Basic sitting directly to my right. Mm -hmm. Shanali, so um, what? Goldman Sachs were watching for their uh, advice revenues, but for Citi, we're very interested to know what, how Russia is going to affect them. Yeah, that's certainly true. When you looked at what happened with J.P. Morgan, out of the reserve bills, about one third was tied to essentially single name Russian securities. As we know, that was in the investment bank, that was tied to asset and wealth management. For Citigroup, they also have a sprawling consumer operation when it comes to Russia, so a bigger picture on what they can expect there. For J.P. Morgan, I've got to say also two thirds of this reserve build was also tied to uh, reflect the increasing probability of a recession, what they called a Volcker style uh, inflation induced recession. So a lot of risks on the horizon there. Shalini, you talked to us about the Russia-Ukraine risks, right? You talked about the Volcker risk. What else should we, we be watching for? You did some great reporting yesterday about the VAR risk. Walk us through what you're watching. Yeah, interestingly, and I should say that they said the probability of a recession was uh, went from low to uh, a little less low. So they're not predicting a recession by any means on the horizon, but they do have to reserve for it. The other thing they were uh, worried about was quantitative tightening. So the effects on that, there's a lot of worry still about what that could mean and um, the fact that we've never seen it before. Oil markets as well. Jamie Dimon called them precarious. And as we know, Citigroup and Goldman Sachs have big commodities exposures. So we'll see how the trading goes there. Janali, thank you very much. We'll have a guest on later during the program to walk us through some more of the detail on the banking sector. Bloomberg's Janali Basak. Uh, now, the ECB debates its latest monetary policy decision today. The war in Ukraine and its effects on growth plus runaway inflation will be top of the agenda. For more, let's get to Maria Tadeo, our European correspondent in Frankfurt. Maria, central banks around the world dealing with these twin contrasting uh, 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 flows, if you like, the inflation threat but also threats to growth. This really comes to the fore in Europe. Yeah, very much. And I would say it's a European Central Bank that really presents this case, this dichotomy that is so difficult to navigate. On the one hand, we've seen the implications of the war in Ukraine persistently, consistently. The growth forecasts for the euro area have been slashed over the past few weeks, and yet inflation continues to go through the roof. Yesterday, just to give you one example, we had Spanish inflation now in double digits. So this is really the complicated space that the European Central Bank is going to have to navigate today. And it's not an easy one because a lot of the factors are around it they can't control and they don't have an answer for it. by the way we don't know when this war is going to end we don't know the impact of sanctions and we're not done on that front and then of course you have the biggest wild card here which is do we get an energy embargo in Europe if we do get one at that point Anna your inflation expectations your inflation bets they're off the charts so a lot of this is going to be complicated for Christine Lagarde today we're not expecting a policy decision as I say but there's three things in particular that investors are focused on when it comes to the press conference one is do we get that very clear hawkish tilt now remember it is very clear by now that the hawks are in command in the governing council but is she going to manifest that when it comes to the end of QE the market is guided for summer in Q3 but she could be more explicit and now hint at the end of June that has huge repercussions for the first rate hike now it's already priced for September there's nothing she can push back on on that front because the market is now sure we are going to get a rate hike this year potentially even two and then the other thing which to me potentially is the most interesting thing here is does she going to mention will she hint at potentially a plan B a tool to contain some of the spreads if we do see that market volatility as a result of this exit strategy from QE. 
Maria, thanks very much. Bloomberg's Maria today with your briefing on what to expect from the European Central Bank. She's live in Frankfurt, of course. Now, President Biden is sending heavy weapons to Ukraine. The president has authorized $800 million in new firepower for the Ukrainians, including artillery, armored personnel carriers, and helicopters. Anne-Marie Hordern, Bloomberg Washington correspondent, joins us now in D.C. Anne-Marie, what do we know? Well, it's another drawdown, and it's going to go directly from U.S. stocks over to Ukraine. And it comes after the president spoke to President Zelensky yesterday on a phone call and really just wants to step up this aid, given the fact that U.S. officials, Ukrainian military officials, they all tell you that what Russia is planning to do is really just focus on eastern Ukraine. So Secretary John Kirby of the Pentagon says this drawdown will tailor to meet those urgent needs as Russia shifts from east to eastern Ukraine. Now, it's a wide swath and breadth of the artillery, military equipment, even things like protective equipment of chemical, biological weapons, individual suits for that. So a number of different uh, weaponry will be sent over in support. One item that the U.S., though, has drawn a red line at is those fighter jets that President Zelensky has called for. But the U.S. is really walking a line here to make sure that there isn't a massive blowback and repercussions from all this aid that they're sending to Ukraine from Moscow. Bloomberg's Anne-Marie Hordern in Washington. Thank you so much for your time and your insight, as always. In related news, we should note that Russia has threatened to deploy nuclear weapons in and around the Baltic Sea region if Finland and Sweden decide to join NATO. We'll discuss this later today with the former prime minister of Finland, Alex Stubb. That's at 11.30 a.m. New York. 4.30 p.m. in London. In other news, the suspect in the New York City subway shooting will also face a federal terrorism charge. Frank James was arrested yesterday, a day after the attack at a Brooklyn subway station, injuring more than two dozen people. Breon Peace, the U.S. attorney for the US Eastern District of New York, spoke yesterday. But the bright spots of the incredible heroism of our fellow New Yorkers helping each other in a time of crisis, the quick response by our first responders, and the hard work by all of our law enforcement partners that has been ongoing is truly uh, a bright spot here. Shelly Banjo, Bloomberg's New York Bureau Chief, joins us now for more. Shelly, walk us through what we know about not only the suspect, but just how he was apprehended. Right. So the police were able to find a number of his possessions, uh, trace back a key that was uh, among his possessions that he left in the train car to a U-Haul van that had been rented to, um, to his name, uh, rented in Philadelphia, driven up to New York. And they were able to find some video footage of him um, entering the station and leaving one station, but not necessarily accounting for his whereabouts for about 24 hours. And so eventually they were able to get a tip that called him into a McDonald's in the East Village in Manhattan. He wasn't at the McDonald's, but they drove around, and after a few minutes they were able to apprehend him with no incident. Unbelievable. Really amazing story, um, Shelley. In in other news, but, you know, coincidentally with this, we're seeing a surge in COVID cases. Um, the, the reason I think about these two is connected is because, you know, he was wearing a mask. It's harder to identify people with wearing masks. We've had a, a loosening of rules around masks, but are we going to see them come back now as uh, we have a spike in cases in New York City? Well, they uh, did extend the masks on mass transit despite, you know, for another couple of weeks that was set to expire. I don't think, you know, we're going to see a reversal of many mandates necessarily, uh, but I think you'll see an uptick of voluntary mask wearing or, you know, people being more cautious as people like the governor warns people, you know, Easter, Passover holidays coming up, be cautious, that kind of thing, because we are seeing a spike in cases again. Well, Bloomberg's Shelley Banjo, thank you so much for once again your time and for your reporting on this issue. Let's look at some of the stocks moving in the pre-market trading here. Uh, a lot of movement here, especially when it comes to the tech sector. Some of this is going to be a little bit of spillover when it comes to uh, simply what we saw in China and what that spillover means for the tech space. I also want to talk about what this means for IBM. You can see a 1.6 percent uh, increase when it comes to IBM. A lot of people saying that Morgan Stanley, among them, that this is now a defensive play. Do you see mega cap tech now kind of yielding that spot to some of those old guard names, IBM, HP, some of those other names that started to make a little bit of news. We should also talk about the first bank to report this morning, and that, of course, is going to be Wells Fargo. And remember, this clearly comes with the rate hike in mind. What does that mean for the consumer, especially that loan growth story? Wells Fargo very exposed to what's going on on the ground. The regional bank presence important with that bank. You can see those shares up 1% in the pre-market. And let's end with a downside story. Synopsis, this time probed on allegations it gave tech to Huawei and SMI 
IC down 5.5%. As we talked about those geopolitical tensions, Anna, these companies are really going to be in the limelight. Yeah, absolutely. In focus then for us. We're talking about that. We're also talking about central bank rate decisions. Evelyn Herman, European economist at Bank of America, will be joining us shortly to talk about the ECB rate decision ahead and all of the commentary around, uh, well, just how hawkish will it be? That's one of the questions. And more on bank earnings with uh, Timothy Morgan, KBW, U.S. financial specialist. How does he separate out all of the U.S. financials reporting today? Plus, Bloomberg Surveillance is live from the IMF World Headquarters in Washington, D.C. We'll We'll be speaking with a host of guests, including First Deputy Managing Director Gita Gopinath and Managing Director Christina Gorgieva. This is Bloomberg. Welcome back to Bloomberg Surveillance. We are simulcast on both Bloomberg Radio and on Bloomberg Television. I'm Matt Miller here in New York with Kriti Gupta. Kaylee Lines is out today. Anna Edwards with us as usual out of London. Now, I'm looking at the kind of volatility we've seen in Treasury markets over the last um, few weeks and months. We haven't seen for years, really, and specifically at the two-year. The huge drop that we saw this week in two-year yields is the biggest that we've seen since March of 2020, right at the beginning of the pandemic. Justina Lee joins us, Bloomberg Markets reporter, um, to talk about what this means for markets and really the steepening of the curb, Justina. Yeah, it's quite interesting because we've seen this shift across the global bond market these past couple of days. And it feels like investors are starting to be a little bit more convinced that the central banks have inflation down. We've had these like big rate moves this week, you know, from Canada and from New Zealand. And people, of course, are expecting the Fed to move in that direction as well very soon. And so we've had bond yields kind of coming down again. Of course, part of that could also just be people feel like people feeling like yields have gone up too much. And so it seems like there is a bit of a buy the rumors, all the news kind of going on with bonds right now. OK, and uh, good morning to you, Justina. Let me ask you about China, because this is in danger of being missed, isn't it? Because we have European markets closed tomorrow and we have US markets largely closed tomorrow. And yet we are expecting there is a lot of expectation in the markets that we'll get substantial easing measures from the Chinese central bank. What, what is what is the thinking? Right. I mean, it's interesting because, of course, everywhere else we're talking about tightening. But in China, economists are expecting a cut to the reserve requirement ratio and also like to the policy interest rate. And that's, of course, because we've seen like risks on the economy coming from these prolonged lockdowns. And so it, it's kind of interesting because the Chinese policymakers are also in a bind because they're moving in the opposite direction, which could lead to capital outflows and more pressure on the Chinese currency. Justina, quickly, we'll pick up on that, essentially, this diversion that you're seeing in policy when it comes to the Fed and the PBOC. How are markets squaring that divergence in policy that you aren't really seeing the entire world raising rates together? Right. I mean, China, of course, has always been a little bit more independent in that capital controls kind of shields the economies from like the global fund flows. But it doesn't mean it's entirely immune. And I think we could see the pressure kind of pick up from here because this week we just saw the premium of Chinese bond yields over Treasury yields disappear. And that's very remarkable given, of course, that China um, historically has always had a bit of a premium over uh, developed market bonds. Yeah, I remember post GFC, Chinese divergence was a big theme and actually something of a saving grace for uh, much of the global economy. Uh, Justina, thank you very much. Bloomberg's Justina Lee with us on set here in London. And for more market analysis, check out MLIV Go on the Bloomberg terminal. That's where you'll find the Markets Live blog. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Kriti Gupta in New York and Anna Edwards in London. Now, keeping you up to date with the news from around the world, here is the first word. Ukraine's allies believe they have a two-week window to send in heavier weapons like tanks to aid the Ukrainian military. After that time, Russian forces may launch an offensive in the eastern part of the country. There's speculation that Vladimir Putin wants to declare some sort of victory by May 9th. That's the anniversary of Germany's defeat in World War II. 
The European Union is warning its own members against Vladimir Putin's rubles for gas demands. It requires European countries that buy Russian gas open two accounts, one of them in rubles. The EU says that by giving in to Putin, countries would be violating sanctions imposed after the invasion of Ukraine. And in China, President Xi Jinping says his government will stick to its zero-tolerance approach to the coronavirus. That's despite public anger and mounting economic costs. Xi spoke the same day that Shanghai reported a record of almost 28,000 new cases. The city's 25 million residents have been locked down for several weeks. And you may soon see higher prices if you buy things from Amazon. The e-commerce giant will levy a 5% fuel and inflation fee on online merchants that use its shipping services. That will put pressure on sellers to raise prices. Coming up, Evelyn Herman, Bank America, European economists ahead of the ECB. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. Here's what you need to know. Four of Wall Street's biggest banks report earnings today. Citigroup, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley and Wells Fargo come out with results. Investors will be waiting to see if they're hurt by market fallout from the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The European Central Bank is likely to prioritize the fight against inflation over risks to the economy caused by the war in Ukraine. The bank is set to maintain its speedier withdrawal of stimulus when it wraps up a meeting in Frankfurt today. And President Biden is sending in the heavy weapons to Ukraine. The president has authorized $800 million in new firepower for the Ukrainians, including artillery, armored personnel carriers and helicopters. Meanwhile, Russia is warning how it may respond if Sweden and Finland decide they want to join NATO. I'm Anna Edwards in London with Matt Miller and Chrissy Gupta over in New York. Kaylee Lines is off today. And uh, Matt, in terms of the European session, we're waiting, of course, for the ECB. What's caught your eye ahead of the U.S. start? I feel like we're waiting for the ECB to some extent as well because you don't see a heck of a lot going on in terms of U.S. futures right now. You do see yields that have come down substantially um, from yesterday. S&P futures, little change right now, um, but the 10-year yield down at 268 44. Remember yesterday we were at 276, the highest level since the end of 2018. So we've uh, moved down substantially from there. Of course, I just showed you the two years moved down substantially as well. Still a spread between those two, a positive uh, spread. NYMEX crude right now off a half a percent, but at a relatively high level, 103.72. And we see the global benchmark Brent up over 108. So fuel costs continue to remain high, or at least um, oil does. Bitcoin is down, but not by much right now, trading at 41,000 and change just a little bit above where we saw it here yesterday. So you're not getting a lot of indications um, from these assets. We're really kind of sitting on our hands waiting for Christine Lagarde. Uh, Critty, what do you see in terms of pre-market movers? Well, it kind of feels like a tech-friendly day. You are seeing a little bit of gains come into the to tech space. IBM, for example, gaining after Morgan Stanley touting it as a defensive play. They're not the only ones. You're seeing this new idea that the old guard in tech is perhaps the new defensive play compared to your Apples, your Microsofts. So we'll keep an eye on those stocks, of course. IBM taking a little bit of a bid today. Wells Fargo as well. It's the first bank to report uh, in the slew of bank earnings that we get stateside. And now, of course, we're going to talk about the rate hike impact, specifically on the consumer. Consumer, Wells Fargo having much more exposure to the regional bank space that you are seeing uh, across the United States. And lastly, let's talk about a downside story. Synopsis probed on allegations it gave to tech to Huawei and SMIC. As we talk about geopolitical tensions, not just with Russia, but with China, you are going to see names like this underperform. So down 5.5%. Anna. Yeah, absolutely. A talking point. Kriti, this is what we're seeing in the European uh, uh, European trading uh, story today. Entirely flat on European stocks as we, to echo Matt, sit on our hands and wait for the ECB. So no movement in European stocks. It's been quite a volatile morning, actually, the first few hours of trading here in Europe. Atlantia is a really interesting M&A story. Mm. This is a highway operator in Italy. They've received a bid from the Benetton family and from Blackstone. If this goes through, it could be $20 billion the size of this deal, and that would make it the largest takeover year to date. 
Of course, there hasn't been perhaps some of the big transactions we would expect, uh, given the geopolitical risk and volatility in markets. Ericsson down by 6%. Here we've got geopolitics as well. They disappointed markets with their numbers, and part of that was due to their pullout from Russia, leaving space for the likes of Huawei, which Chrissy was just talking about a moment ago. Uh, but So that's part of the story. They also said they're going to face a fine from the DOJ, and that's in connection with their business over in Iraq. Euro dollar in focus as we head towards the ECB. More on that in just a moment. A quick look at where we are on Russian assets, and we're seeing weakness once again on Russian stocks, and that's actually been the story of much of April so far in terms of Russian equities. Uh, this market, described by our guest yesterday as broken, this is the ruble market, of course, it's been supported by capital controls. We understand our reporting around Russia suggests that uh, the, the Russian government is considering pulling back or dialing back some of those controls, in particular around corporates' requirements to turn foreign exchange into rubles. That's certainly something we're watching, Matt. Yeah, watching that very closely indeed. Um, also, of course, the ECB. Let's get to that right now with Evelyn Herman, Bank America, European economist. Evelyn, as we, um, you know, sort of fall over ourselves to um, forecast more and more rate hikes from the Fed um, through the next 12 months, what are we expecting from the ECB? And could we see action today? Yeah, so uh, for the ECB, our call is that we start the hiking cycle in December. September is very much a possibility, but uh, real economic data might create that moment of hesitation eventually. But we expect the ECB to start hiking in December and then proceed at quarterly pace with five hikes of 25 bips, such that at the end of 23, we are at what we consider neutral rates, so 75 bips for the depot rate and 100 bips for the refuge rate. There is a risk they move earlier. Uh, then December, so September is very much live um, from that perspective. Today, I think it's a bit too early to expect drastic action. We've seen a continuation of that hawkish pivot with every inflation print that has surprised to the upside. And the latest March print with 7.5% is one of those that surprised the ECB's own forecast to the upside. So there's probably a continued trajectory or a continued path for the ECB towards a more hawkish communication. For us today, mm. that may more mean that they flag that APP will end at the very beginning of Q3, possibly even go as far as specifying that it will be July. But in the context okay. of the very high, yeah, uh, but in the context of very high geopolitical. Um, uncertainty and very little data flow other than inflation uh, um, showing the impact of war in Ukraine on the euro area so far. It's probably really too early for the ECB to head into firm decisions. Okay. On policy That's interesting. Uh, the, the timetable that you set out there, Evelyn, is interesting because if we do yeah. see them bring forward the dates around APP mm -hmm. or firm up the dates around APP, there's a big gap between June, July, that period, if that's when it ends, and December when you're expecting a rate hike, given the way that central banks around the world are hiking rates at this point, aside from China. Are, are, you, really, are you really thinking that the ECB would just be able to uh, sit still during that period or, or are we underestimating the growth risks at this point? Uh, I think it's a mix of both. So, yes, it's our best case that we do manage to wait until December, but it's not something the ECB will guide to in our expectations. So it's really the outcome of the September meeting in that scenario rather than something that the ECB will communicate preemptively, that period of waiting. So we do think uh, that the growth impact of what we are seeing at the moment might be underestimated. The ECB's own GDP forecasts currently imply roughly 1% of quarterly growth rates non-annualized, so really 1% quarter on quarter over the summer quarters. Uh, in our own scenario, we are at 0 0.1, 0 0.2 for the euro area. And in mm. that context, there might just be this moment of hesitation. I agree if they end APP in July, the way to December is longer, but we have had very, we have had no real economic data yet on the impact of this very high inflation in the energy space that we are seeing today um, okay. on real economic activity. Let but me ask you something is, uh, a little yeah. different. Uh, another yeah. focus from the meeting, apologies, Evelyn, another focus from the meeting is going to be this tool that they've maybe talked about, has yes. been talked about, uh, something aimed at controlling spreads or, or, or uh, mm -hmm. intervening in some way in spreads. I mean, you tell me what you're expecting here. And in fact, we are seeing spread widening around Italy just today. Yeah, uh, I, I think it's too early for that. Well, we think it's too early for that spread program just yet. The doves have been pushing for that to accompany the normalization process. So as the ECB progresses with rate hikes, approaches neutral, uh, we might have to consider in the euro area space transmission mechanisms, so uh, uh, spread widening. And that tool that is being discussed now among ECB staff is, a, is, is one that could become necessary over that period of time. 
I don't think this is something the ECB will consider necessarily preemptively. So that technical work is being done around such a product is probably normal given the dog's push for it. But for a proper announcement of such, such spread product, it's probably really too early still. She will very likely get asked in the press conference around that. Um, but for her to deliver technical details when the governing council is really not in agreement on that is, I think, too high a bar at this juncture. Evelyn, we've talked about the monetary side of this. Let's talk about the fiscal side of this. One of the real mm -hmm. uh, kind of markers of the last Eurozone crisis that followed the great financial crisis, the last recession we saw in 2009, was austerity by a lot of fiscal governments in Europe. This time around, you're seeing the polar opposite, essentially, a lot of fiscal support. At what point do you see that fiscal support getting removed, essentially the punch bowl getting taken away for Europe? Yeah, so I think it's not the polar opposite quite yet because we're not flooding the euro area with fiscal support. So we're doing the minimum necessary still to avoid much worse outcomes. Um, that probably helps the ECB and the whole for policy normalization processes to press ahead. But so far, what we have seen from the fiscal policy side is tentative shielding of lower income groups and select countries from the energy price shock where we have less savings stock accumulated. Uh, we have seen some headline inflation effective measures, but they are relatively small, these 15 cent, 30 cent price cuts on uh, pump prices on diesel and gasoline that are relatively common across your area countries. So that's all fiscal policy support of sorts, but it really leaves us still with a trajectory in which we have six and a half, in our forecast, six and a half percent headline inflation this year, which probably still means a chunky 3%, if not more, real disposable income decline. That's a lot for the economy to digest in spite of fiscal policy um, being much more active than it was uh, during the euro area crisis. So we're managing to put a floor under it. We have a supportive mm. fiscal policy. We're starting to deploy a little bit of the rule book that we've seen during the pandemic. Um, <clears throat> so you've seen that with state back guarantees, KFW programs in Germany coming back, France, same thing. So we see that being deployed. But again, it's like during the pandemic, it's very powerful, it's very helpful, but it is not sufficient yet to touch the buffer the potential real economy loss hmm. and the, the private sector income loss that we are currently confronting on the back of this energy price shock. And so far, if you Evelyn. look at the packages in most countries, sorry, just to finish on that, they focus really on the household side. And I think that's one element perhaps sometimes forgotten <laughs> on the corporate side has to cope with higher energy prices as well. Uh, and Evelyn, that's thank you very much, Evelyn Herman, Bank of America, Anytime. European economist. Thank you very much for joining us. Good to get your perspective. Coming up on the program, what to expect from bank earnings with Timothy Morgan of KBW. We've heard from JP Morgan. We're going to hear from four big banks in the US today. What to expect? This is Bloomberg. Back. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. You're looking at a live shot of the principal room. Coming up later today, New York Fed President John Williams. That's at 8.30 a.m. in New York, 1.30 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. Wars are unpredictable. Wars have unpredictable outcomes. You've already seen in oil markets, the oil markets are... Are, are precarious okay so i pointed that out over and over that if you know people don't understand that those things can change dramatically jp morgan ceo jamie diamond there speaking on an earnings call jp morgan's results yesterday were marred by the market fallout from russia's invasion of ukraine today will be a bumper day for U.S. bank earnings. That was just an appetizer on Wednesday. Today, Citi, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, and Wells Fargo are all reporting. Joining us now is Tim Morgan, desk strategist for Tin FinTech and U.S. Financials at KBW. Tim, welcome to the program. Thanks so much for joining us. What's going to be your main focus? I mean, is really the Russia Russian invasion of Ukraine the biggest effect on um, bank earnings this season? Hi, Matt, and thanks for having me on this morning. Um, yes and no. The short story is actually what we learned from yesterday's JP numbers. That maybe the most important thing is going to be capital. Um, the, we, we all have come into the earnings knowing that we're going to have some volatility from markets uh, and uh, losses from uh, the Ukraine and Russian activity. Uh, but what we learned yesterday was that we've also got some accounting adjustments, like for counterparty risk that have to come into place this year. 
And the result of that has been uh, we had a big decline um, in the CET1 or common equity tier one ratio at JP Morgan um, from about 13.1 uh, to 11.9%. That's maybe confusing for people that don't follow banks, but the short story is it means that buybacks may be disappearing from the big banks, and that's what we'll be looking for guidance on this year, because it's going to be a big negative for the market if these guys can't buy their stocks while they're selling off into uncertainty. What about trading, Tim? I mean, yesterday, I think we expected a drop in trading from JPN, and in fact, they beat the streets estimate by a billion dollars. What are we looking for in terms of the banks reporting today? So that's a good point. I mean, you know, anything can happen. JP is, of course, just one bank, so we'll see how it goes. We're expecting numbers still to be challenged across the street, and at KBW, our numbers are actually uh, lower than everybody else's. We've been quite conservative on what we're estimating. Um, again, you have to bear in mind that with the increases in volatility uh, and with some pretty obvious losses that needed to be taken, you know, we wanted to have a conservative position on trading as well as investment banking coming into the quarter. Um, what we always learn every quarter is that some of the banks surprise us with being better than others on managing volatility and on taking positions. Uh, so you know we'll, we'll we'll have to wait and see what comes out of it. But quite frankly, we were relatively negative across the universals uh, and preferring spread-based uh, lenders coming into this quarter. Tim, I want to stick on that theme of volatility and specifically VAR risk when it comes to just how much these banks are having to step in, essentially become market makers, coming off of several, several quarters of really record trading revenue. Can you talk to us a little bit about just how long they're going to have to play that role? Well, that's a good question, Kriti. Thank you. But, um, you know, the interesting thing is, of course, after the crisis of 2009, the banks are a lot more limited on the ability that they have to play market maker. Um, and uh, instead, uh, looking at what happened with Nickel and J.P. Morgan, I mean, we've seen them become loss takers uh, instead. Um, so, uh, quite frankly, I, I don't have a strong opinion right now about just how much they're going to be swelling their balance sheets. And I think, frankly, part of the problem we've had in markets for over the last 10 years is that we've been missing the banks being there to act as a buffer. Mm. Uh, good morning to you, Tim. Do you think that this quarter we could see quite a divergent performance amongst these large bank names because of the volatility we've seen in markets and because the different structures of the businesses will mean that they might respond differently to that volatility, whether that's around share trading or other assets uh, or whether that's around investment banking and a lack of corporate activity? Oh, you're dead right, Anna, and thanks for that. I mean, it, we could get some really pleasant surprises about somebody having taken uh, the uh, the right side in some obviously tragic circumstances. Um, so, uh, you know, we'll have to wait and see. But we do know, uh, you know coming into this that everybody had to get ready to uh, reposition uh, their uh, balance sheets for higher losses, higher VAR, um, and, you know, obvious losses that everyone's had to take. I mean, the other thing that was a big surprise um, was the extent to which higher interest rates, um, and uh, that's at the long end of the curve as well as the short end, have forced marks to market on their balance sheets and books. What are the clues you're looking for on the domestic consumer side? Because some of these banks, the ones with more of a domestic focus perhaps, might be interesting on that front. Yeah, thanks, Anne. And actually, the U.S. domestic story is great. Um, short story, I mean, we had over 30% growth uh, in, in credit card volumes at J.P. Morgan. Uh, year over year. Um, I mean, the consumer and loan growth all look really healthy in the U.S. at this stage. Uh, the obvious question, uh, you know, that everyone's wondering, and, and this was a big subject on the call yesterday, is the degree to which higher inflation and higher rates slow the economy or even tip it into recession. Tim, thanks so much. Thanks for joining us. Tim Morgan of KBW uh, giving us thoughts ahead of some of the... Happy birthday. ...in the banking seg. Do we not? <laughs> ...and well wishes <laughs> from Matt Miller. Coming up later today, we will speak with the CFO of Wells Fargo about that bank's latest results. That's at 4 p.m. in New York, 9 p.m. in London. This is Bloomberg. This is Bloomberg Surveillance Early Edition. I'm Matt Miller with Anna Edwards in London. I'm Matt Miller in New York with Anna Edwards in London. It's the end of an era for Lamborghini. The Italian car maker is producing one final limited edition of the infamous Aventador before the electric revolution takes over, or at least a hybrid revolution. I spoke with the CEO, Stefan Winkelmann.
The edition is called Ultime, which is Latin, it's the last edition. Uh, so this is the last of a kind of a V12 engine only. The follow of the Aventador will have a, a complete new V12, but also a plug-in hybrid system. So this one is going to be built in 600 times. We already started the production, 350 coupes and 250 roadster, and uh, they're all sold out. So this was a very positive result in, uh, in a very short time. So I have to buy one in the aftermarket. Uh, yes. Uh, you're releasing, I saw also something about an NFT. You're releasing an NFT with this? Yes, we, this is our second try with NFT. We had one a couple of months ago, which w went very well. This one, we are coupling the, the real car with, a, with an NFT. And we will see down the road how this is working out for a brand like ours. But it's a perfect match because our people are very much into uh, di digitalization, NFT, metaverse, all of this. And also, uh, people out of this world are very interested in our brand. So it's a good turnout. I saw that it's costing you 1.8 billion in terms of development and you're financing that all yourself, which led me to ask the question, could you be a standalone you know, company? Um, obviously still part of the Volkswagen Group, is that a possibility? But today we are in a very uh, positive financial situation. So the 1.8 billion euro is around about uh, 2 billion US dollars. They are linked to the fact that we are going to hybridize. It's not even including uh, the model number four, which will be full electric. At time being, the things are, are looking great, but uh, we are very happy to be part of the group, so there is no thought uh, to be independent. Lamborghini Chairman and CEO Stefan Winkelmann there, of course, a storied uh, career um, himself. He also ran Bugatti before it uh, left the Volkswagen Group. Now um, they're going to release Anna three new hybrid models over the next decade, and then a fourth fully electric model, which I think comes from the plans at Bugatti. They're gonna now incorporate in Lamborghini, be able to really move up a level in terms of luxury and price, because now they're the sort of pinnacle of all of the Volkswagen brands. By the way, I'm gonna go over to Chelsea after this program. I'm gonna talk to the CEO of BMW. I also got to speak with the head of McLaren Racing, Zach Brown. So, you know, we have the car show going on in New York right now, a lot going on around mm. automobiles. We just had a surprise um, profit from Volkswagen, eight and a half billion euros after a huge hedging boost. So a lot going on in cars. Matt, keeping the focus where he likes it to be on the auto sector, he's, a, he's across that beat. We're all watching out for the ECB, of course, and we're also watching out for central bank decisions elsewhere. We've heard from a number of central banks over recent days hiking rates, but now it's time for China, and there's wide expectation that tomorrow, whilst many markets around the world are closed, we are going to hear from the Chinese central bank, and they're going to be cutting interest rates. So a real policy divergence. We talked about this with our colleague Justina Lee a little bit earlier on. There's an expectation we get a, a cut in the interest rate, also a cut in the triple R, that's the reserve uh, requirement, the, the amount of reserves that banks need to hold uh, sort of on hand or in reserve. Uh, so there's going to be a lot of focus on the way that China is, is, is going in a different direction because, of course, of the COVID yeah. fight. And can it really uh, heal the damage to the Chinese econ yep. the economy that is being caused by the way they're fighting well, COVID? I, right I heard a great conversation that you had on radio this morning um, with a woman who was saying that, you know, China's further along in the cycle than the Western world, and they're in, in a tightening... Mm. In a loosening phase rather than tightening, which I thought was really interesting. Yeah, absolutely. We will be uh, back with more surveillance straight ahead. That's it for the early edition. Uh, during the surveillance program, they'll be hearing from the New York Fed President John Williams and Gita Gopinath of the IMF. A lot of focus on the IMF uh, conference today. This is Bloomberg.